everyone. Thank you all for making it for this very late session. Uh, very excited to be talking in front of a packed hall uh, about a subject that we are all very, uh, uh, well, we all have very strong views on it. Uh, the democracy divide, universal norms and local practices. So, Tony Abbott, let me start with you. Basic freedoms, uh, an equal right to vote, the rule of law, uh, these are uh, the fundamental traits of any democracy. But our world is changing. In the digital age, how do you think democracy is evolving? Democracy is never easy uh, because uh, uh, the people are sometimes uh, restive and divided and fragmented. Um, and trying to assemble a majority of the people uh, is, a, is a massive challenge. Uh, and, and yes, it is becoming more complicated. 24-7 uh, social media, uh, I guess uh, increasing uh, ethnic diversity, um, all sorts of things that have changed, perhaps the decline of organised religion in many countries. Uh, so, yeah... Democracy is perhaps harder today than it's ever been before, uh, but that doesn't mean that we should abandon democracy. It just means that we need to strive for better leadership. So uh, democracy hasn't failed. Um, when it doesn't go as well as it should, uh, that's the politician's fault, and we should elect better politicians. We should elect better politicians. Uh, uh, yes, and I, I mentioned the digital age. You, you talked about social media and other things. Now there's artificial intelligence. And uh, uh, it appears that politicians everywhere in the world are woefully unprepared to deal with what AI can do to democracy. So that was my question. How is it evolving? Well, look, uh, I don't claim to be at the forefront of technological uh, insights and knowledge. But as far as I can work out, uh, even AI is still more an aggregator than an initiator. Um, I don't believe that, well, put it this way, I, I think AI compared to human intelligence is like photography compared to art. Um, yes, they have their place. Uh, but if you want something that's really creative and really inventive uh, that can make the imaginative leap um, I think a, a human beats a machine any time. Mehdi Joma, your country, Tunisia, uh, is one of the, perhaps the only success story of the Arab Spring. Uh, and you've, you've called uh, Tunisian democracy a startup. Um, and you've said that it's a startup that needs constant investment, not just monetary, but otherwise. Do you want to tell us more about it? Uh, what do you mean by that? And what kind of investment do you think it needs? Y yes, you know the context of uh, what, what happens in our region with the Arabic Spring, that we call the Arabic Spring, but uh, some of us now uh, are calling it uh, winters, winter, winter, uh, winter revolution. Uh, anyhow, I call it a startup. It's uh, with regard to the, to the size of the country, which is a small country, uh, with the risks at that time, uh, because it's a nascent uh, democracy, so fragile, and I was calling everywhere to pay attention and to invest in it because of the leverage when it succeeded. It's a big leverage for the country, but uh, for uh, the whole environment, we were not intending to export anything, but we know uh, it was uh, an inspiring experience. Uh, today, we realize uh, how difficult it is uh, really to get a sustainable democracy. And uh, there is some confusion in our mind. Uh, organizing fair uh, elections is not enough to get democracy because uh, democracy is more than that, is a constitution, is institution, and is a practice. And it's never uh, protected if it's uh, not uh, related or if it's not supported uh, by the citizens. So uh, if uh, 10 years after, or less than 10 years after today, we can say we can have uh, a feedback from this experience. Uh, we are speaking about challenges about democracy, the mature democracy we see 
all these challenges with populism, nationalism, uh, authoritarianism. I will say it in French now because it's very, very difficult to, uh, to, to, to pronounce in English. Uh, but uh, you can imagine the situation uh, in the nascent uh, democracies. I think uh, beside the text, beside the institution, what is important is how to uh, uh, make or to ensure to get the right leadership. It's a question of leadership. You see it in the mature. Uh, democracies, when you have the not uh, populism or not the right, not no, 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 not the leadership believing in this democracy, they can deform, they can transform. Uh, in a nascent one, it's uh, more fragile, so it's uh, more exposed. Uh, today, we have to think how to make it robust by uh, enlarge the concept of the institution to something that allows us to be sure that. Uh, uh, what we will arise through the elections is a good leadership. Uh, you know, you can have the best uh, opposition, uh, uh, bright uh, people, uh, good militants, uh, maybe with uh, many, uh, many years or many decades in jail. Uh, but uh, once elected, they have to manage a state. They, ha they, they have to manage uh, a complex a complex organization, they have to, to manage uh, problems, finance, uh, people, resources. Uh, so uh, really there is uh, a, a big challenge uh, facing this uh, uh, fragile and uh, nascent uh, democracies, which is uh, uh, the quality of the leadership that we have to uh, erase. Uh, in a context which, which is very difficult today, you are speaking about the digital uh, context, digital revolution, IA, or uh, any other, and uh, you will see uh, it will be accelerated. Uh, my background is engineer, so I'm aware that, uh, of uh, what is happening there. Uh, I think we have to think about that and to take advantage and to how to protect. Uh, when you see any election today, there is more fake news than true news. And uh, in uh, some cases, uh, you have people elected on the basis of fake news, on speeches which are not true. Uh, so it's a real challenge, and I think it's the role of uh, the civil society, but as well the state, uh, when it's doing the, the, right, uh, the, right, the right things, how to encourage uh, the, the media, how to deliver uh, the right, uh, and in a continuous manner, uh, the right news, uh, to, to face that, how to, to play uh, the, the, the transparency. Uh, so, democracy, maybe it's, uh, it's challenged, or uh, you have some other regimes who are saying that democracy is not uh, efficient or authority is maybe more efficient. Uh, we think that uh, it's maybe not. Uh, not uh, uh, not um, perfect, but uh, it still is the best way to balance between uh, uh, effective, uh, effect, effective stability and uh, and uh, and freedom. So, uh, so it's a it's, good compromise. It's better to have an imperfect democracy yes. uh, than strive for a perfect then, one. And you're talking about the challenges of nascent democracies, <laughs> but I think the world's oldest democracy is also grappling with challenges. I know there's a separate America session, but we'll come to the U.S. as well. Yude uh, Alakija, uh, would you say that there there is no one size fits all? Uh, democratic system that that will work and uh, while while countries uh, in Africa Asia elsewhere have tried to uh, to follow the Western model or the traditional model of a democracy uh, they have to grapple with their own unique challenges and adapt democratic systems to suit their own uh, specific needs thank you and thank you for for having me it's a delight to see you all in spite of the very exciting America session next door um, I've posited earlier that perhaps we should all go over there and help pitch in and tell them what we think democracy is. Um, I think you, you've heard just from both Mehdi and, and Tony about leadership and also about institutions. And I would, rep I would sort of posit that true democracy is about representational leadership. And we we're talking earlier about who determines 
what democracy is, and you've asked that not one size fits all. In my region where I come from, I'm from Nigeria, West Africa at the moment is on the brink because we have three countries that have chosen to move away from ECOWAS because they've been taken over by what you would call coup leaders who have taken the countries over because they believe that what is defined for them as democracy doesn't appeal. And why is that? And so I think we have to go back a few steps. It's not, it's not just about, you know, how do we have decent democracies? Who, who determines what is democracy? Democracy in its purest form, you know, the Greek, obviously, we all know is power to the people. But I think we're conflating power with democracy. I think we're in a place now in the world where we're conflating power with democracy. And so let me use my own traditional cultural background and say that pre-colonialism in Nigeria, we had our own institutions that were democratic. They were people powered. They were led by obas, by chiefs, and they were truly representational of the people because there were checks and balances. There were systems of accountability. It wasn't, you know, democracy to me is about ensuring that there isn't untrammeled power. And what we're seeing more and more today, not just in Africa or in parts of Asia or in, in but also in the West, is we're seeing states where there is untrammeled power. So I think what people are rejecting is not so much democracy, because who tells you what is democracy? You know, I think, you know, I think it's Desmond Tutu, the saying, who said that when the white man came to Africa, they came with the Bible and we had the land. And when they left, they had the land and we had the Bible. Um, I would add to that, not only did, did they have the land and we had the Bible, but we also had their forms of representational leadership. And in doing so, we threw away the baby with the bathwater. We threw away our own traditional system. So why it doesn't work in many countries, this so-called democracy of today, is because we have rejected those traditional cultural systems. And so people don't fully understand. You know, we had a conversation about recent elections in Pakistan, in Bangladesh, many other countries. You know, in, in, in my own country, Nigeria, people will exchange a vote for three onions and, and a, 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 a sachet of Maggi cubes. Why? Because of poverty. Why? Because we've had untrammeled power, because we've had no restraint, because there's been no checks and balances, and there's been no accountability. So let me go back to Mali, to Burkina Faso, and to Niger. So why, why you're seeing these young bucks come up nowadays is they're saying that, look, the only people who have power are either the politicians with the money or those of us with the gun. And so the gun is now taking over from those with money. But if we look back at our cultural heritage, we had other systems that were more representative. I'll leave it at that. I can see Tony itching to... to, you're, to argu answer. you're arguing for a form of constitutional monarchy. No, I'm not. You are. No, because, I'm I mean, not. this is a blend. Yeah. Constitutional monarchy at its best is a wonderful blend of democracy and tradition. And it's a way of keeping some power out of the hands of the party politicians. I wouldn't say, well, we should let other people speak, but I wouldn't, I mean, in, in, you know, the, yes, and they have that in the UK, which is very interesting. I mean, I'm not sure how well it's going right now. <laughs> um, you know, and so, I, I mean, I wouldn't say that's purely what I'm arguing for. I mean, within the constraints of the time, the limited time that we have, I'm saying that we have traditionally in many parts of the world, you know, I mean, you know, as well as I do, our joint corner of the world, Fiji, um, you know, where Uncle Frank, dear Danielle's Uncle Frank Bainimarama, the former prime minister, threw out the traditional systems of the chief chiefs because he believed it wasn't right. But they brought them back because it wasn't working without them. But anyway, yeah. we could... We'll no, you, you, you made some and, interesting... And in, and in the Arab world, the monarchies are remarkably successful. <laughs> yes, you, 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 you know, it's a debate uh, because uh, uh, if we see the finality is uh, the dividend to the citizen uh, in some area, in some countries, when you see the situation of the citizen, uh, we can say that it's another kind of democracy. May I? Yes. Um, uh, Sanjeev Sanyal, uh, uh, some interesting points have been made here, and I've been meaning to ask you this, that equality is the cornerstone of democracy. Um, and how, how big a role does economic growth play 
uh, in ensuring that a democracy is robust. She mentioned uh, how poverty impacts, how votes can be compromised, how people can be uh, persuaded to, to vote for the wrong person or not the person of their choice with some inducements. So, I mean, obviously, economic growth matters, but is it the case that uh, this condition of America's democracy is better today than it was 100 years ago? They're clearly richer today than they were 100 years ago. Similarly, I mean, India is a very well-established democracy since 1952. And other than an aberration uh, during the 1970s, we have had regular elections, um, uh, free and fair. We have had peaceful changes of government for a very, very long time. So I would say that um, democracy certainly can create conditions for economic growth. And, economic, and you could have a feedback loop through to uh, from economic growth to democracy. So I, I think they co-evolve. I don't think one is a per prerequisite for the other. And China provides the other case. Uh, there was a thinking about 20 years ago that as China became more uh, economically um, uh, uh, successful, that would naturally become a democracy. So there have been this idea that you, I think, uh, are also deriving from. There's some natural flow from economic uh, well-being to wanting democracy. And I think China has clearly proved that that is not the case. And India provides also another example of in the opposite direction where we have been for a long time a democracy well established. And it's only relatively recently that we have begun to generate the kinds of economic growth that you would have said what you know I want to force. So the point I'm making is, look, they are two legs on which a society or a civilization stands on. And uh, while one can occasionally trip the other, um, they are both needed uh, for balance. I think the real problem in India relates to something slightly different, uh, which is, and this relates to, you know, what kind of democracy, I, who decides what kind of democracy. And this is a point actually that is now a somewhat uh, big issue in India for a somewhat different reason. You see, <clears throat> Although we had a democracy of much of a long standing, uh, 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 the problem has been that almost on every democracy index, which various think tanks around the world try to uh, measure the quality of democracy, India, the world's largest democracy, uh, will be counted in somewhere in the ranks of the 90s or even past 100. Now, that is a blatantly, obviously absurd. Uh, we very often get ranked below, uh, you know, countries that have, you know, had coups in recent times like Lesotho or other countries. Uh, now, why is it the case? Clearly, whatever form of democracy we have does not seem to confirm to what North Atlantic think tanks seem to think is a good democracy. So you have, uh, you know, uh, the variety of democracy uh, institute in Stockholm and... Uh, you know, they will have long lists in which on all objective criteria, we do our, we really do well. And then for some strange and utterly uh, inexplicable reasons, uh, based on occasionally very tiny surveys of so-called experts, maybe 10, 20 people, we will get, you know, really low marks. And so the overall number then turns out that we are a very, we'd be always called something strange like electoral autocracy, whatever that means. <laughs> and yeah. why am I making a fuss about this is because these kinds of uh, uh, rankings do have real impact. Now, I wouldn't really care about, you know, um, the getting the you know, certificates from these think tanks if they didn't matter in real life. They do, because ultimately they feed through to things like sovereign ratings. And that affects our cost of borrowing. So this indirectly does have an impact on my economy. Similarly, a new scam that has come up called environmental, social, and governance norms. <laughs> now this turned up on the, on the horizon in 2006 because a UN paper, which cleverly did not define what these ESG norms are. And over the last 15 years, certain again, think tanks and NGOs, almost all of them in the North Atlantic, have basically 
entirely randomly taken it upon themselves to define what they are without any consultation with anyone. And so as a result of which, they suddenly have begun to give everybody points on what is environmentally and socially and governance. Now, in democracy, all those turns up in one of those indicators. Now, why this is important, again, is that these ESG norms are, again, not harmless things. Uh, the European Union, for example, is introducing all kinds of trade barriers, etc., based on ESG norms. And they're clearly there's something odd about it when the best performing ESG norm companies in the world are tobacco companies. <laughs> so they make the biggest political donations, exactly. that's why. Yeah. So clearly there is a scam going on over here. So I think the real problem is not whether, at least in India, the problem is not the quality of our democracy, but the way it is being characterized by a tiny cabal of uh, think tanks and NGOs, etc., all of them based in the North Atlantic, who have been, who have got for themselves this right to gi give out certificates. And let, let me end by saying, I actually looked into the funding of some of these NGOs and think tanks. It is very interesting. All of them are funded by one of four institutions. Ford Foundation, Open Society, <laughs> Rockefeller, I think, was one of them. And there is one more, I forget which is, but four of them accounted for all of them. Very, very interesting points. And I, I think everyone wants to say something, but Sanjeev, I have a follow-up question then. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> we understand what is guiding these ratings or what kind of interests do they serve? Uh, and they matter and they make a difference to our lives. But do you think we have the, the wherewithal to then challenge them or set the record straight? And that is where my question about digitization comes in. Because in, in a world that is controlled by social media and narrative building and all of those institutions also rest in the North Atlantic, how are countries like India and other uh, uh, nascent democracies, evolving democracies, democracies that are not uh, that do not tick the boxes that the West think are the, the right boxes to tick. How are they going to, to challenge that narrative? So this is clearly an issue because um, not only are these rankings, i.e. the framework of thinking about democracy being taken over by a very small cabal. I mean, uh, it may not be more than maybe 50 people. And then there is also the, the, the channels through which this is propagated, social media again, is controlled by a very small group of people. So I agree with you, there needs to be, a, first of all, a proper conversation about who, who decides what these norms are, and are not a cynical one. And secondly, if we have agreed norms of what they are, not only what those agreed norms are, but who does the certification? And what are the consequences of those certifications? So. All of these require a wider discussion. But I think one or two steps forward on this will be that we need think tanks, academia, NGOs, and others in places outside of the North Atlantic, here in Asia, or in Africa, or in South America, the global South generally. But in fact, interestingly, even the global North, other than those who are in the North Atlantic, are not a part of this. The Japanese have no are not a part of this. The Australians are don't uh, impact this conversation at we all. We don't care what they think. Uh, we, we know yeah. we're a democracy. That's good enough for us. Yeah. So I, maybe, you, you, maybe that's an attitude you can take. Yeah. But I do think that there is a case for the Global South to begin to enter these conversations and, um, and uh, you know, be a part of this. You may not care, by the way, in Australia what they think, but it turns out because you you, you tick all the boxes of what the North Atlantic thinks are good things, you actually get ranked very also, highly. Also so you have, don't care for that reason. They have the British yeah. monarch on their currency. So exactly. That, that, that helps. Uh, but I want, to, I want to bring in... Uh, I, 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 I wish our democracy worked listening. as well as India's in many respects. <laughs> no, we also right. tried monarchy for a while. We, in fact, combined <laughs> democracy with a monarchy. Right. <laughs> um, let me, let and, um, you know... Sure, sure, sorry. Let me get Rend uh, in, into the conversation. We've been very patiently listening to everyone. Uh, so uh, one point that we've discussed is the weaponization of democratic institutions and, and ratings agencies. The second is uh, to use democracy as a pretext, uh, as a pretext to, to uh, change a system or uh, 
dare I say, invade a country. We say Russia invaded Ukraine, but we not we do not always say that that the U.S. invaded Iraq, uh, but they did try to to uh, to install their own version of democracy in Iraq, and that experiment has failed. Uh, do you think that such experiments are then doing more harm than good? Well, first of all, let me comment a little bit on what has been said, if I may. Um, I, I agree that leadership is important, but I think we really have to think about democracy. Uh, in terms of a, a sort of an abstract notion that embodies a number of values. And I think those values, uh, we can enumerate them, equal justice, uh, free and fair elections, uh, political participation, inclusion, accountability, and so on. A and these, these values are embodied in institutions. If we don't have the institutions, then we can't translate those values. And the institutions have practices and applications. So it's not enough just to say it's a question of leadership or it's a question of uh, elections. I mean, elections are so often taken to, uh, to mean democracy. Oh, well, they have uh, elections. And sometimes they even say they have free and fair elections. I can tell you from personal experience in a number of countries that I have studied, that there are some very subtle ways of undermining what is called free and fair elections. There are, through media, through money, I mean, even in the US, elections are undermined by the use of, of funds, by funding uh, uh, you know, people who run for elections. So uh, by, by cronyism and so on, there are many, many ways of looking at the, at the sort of surface and saying, well, you know, free and fair elections. And other people, and when you end up with bad leadership, other people say, well, you elected them. Well, actually not so, because very often free and fair elections are actually rigged in ways that are not very visible to the external eye. So I'm talking about elections as a, an, an example, a practical application of what we think of as political participation. And really, unless your values and your institutions and your practices all align, you are always going to have a defective democracy. Now, but, but every when I democracy say a defective, defective democracy, it's because I think democracies are always somewhat defective. Democ democracy, in essence, is an experimental system. Unlike ideology, which is a closed system and always believes that this is right and that is wrong and so on. And therefore, there is no room for flexibility, for evolution, for change. Democracy is the opposite. Democracy is an open system. And as an open system, it has to be flexible, it has to be experimental, it has to be self-correcting. And so when we talk about democracy, we really are talking about a whole range of ideas, concepts, values, institutions, practices, and so on. Now, if we come to the issue of the, the possibility of transplanting democracy, and, and this is the essence of your question. You know, the US went into, uh, I think saying that Russia went into Ukraine in order to establish democracy. If, if that's, that's what I understood. No, 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 that's not what I okay. said. But, I, I but said, you well, said Iraq went, one, the US went into Iraq in order to, the question is, what is it that we try to do? What, what is universal? And, and it's important to discuss what is universal? You spoke about India, for example. The, the universal values, is there anybody in the world who does not want equal justice? Is there anybody in the world who does not want fair representation? Is there anybody in the world who wants a government that is not accountable? These are the values that I'm talking about. Now we come to the institutions, and then we come to the practices. It is in the realm of practices that variations can, can occur, that differences can occur, 
and because of culture, because of history, demographics, and so on and so forth. But I think we ought to be very, very careful that we're not in the name of contextualization actually undermining our institutions or the values of democracy. Because then we really are going to be uh, rated very badly by those uh, North Atlantic institutions. And, and by the way, I think it really is high time that there is a broader conversation about what do we mean about democracy? What values should be upheld? What type of institutions can uh, uh, translate these values or income embody these values? And then what are the practices and where are the differences? There really needs to be a broader conversation, as you say. Uh, well, I firstly think that we need to broaden it from the North Atlantic. I mean, yeah, yeah. One, one of the amazing but, but things... But no that serious person is denying that India is a, is a fine example of democracy, Sanjeev. I mean, India is not just the world's biggest democracy. It's one of the world's oldest democracies. It's an incredibly successful one because it survived all sorts of challenges. And, you know, as, as I was hearing today, any country which builds eight airports, one and a half metro systems every year, and 30 kilometres of motorway every day is doing damn well. Your country is taking off. Congratulations. And um, I, I really think you should have made Tony and I wrestle for the speak for the mic because we're both <laughs> fighting here for the talking stick. Um, but I want to go back to my earlier point when I said that we're conflating democracy with power. And I, I, ma I maintain that. I think we're conflating democracy with power. And back to Sanjeev's point, which I think is very valid about the institutions that determine what's, what's a good democratic system and what's good governance and what isn't. And I'm going to give a personal example. I mean, like Renu here, I've had several examples of really quite interesting elections, some in the, in the Pacific region, in Fiji and in Coos, and some in Nigeria, my own country, where I've had to literally run and duck and dive and literally lie under the bed for fear of guns shooting. So for me, this is not theory, this is not abstract. You know, we can have abstract conversations about what does democracy look like and what do crooked elections look like and what does it feel like to be a young person who speaks up during an election and who fears for your life. Um, you know, there are some of us who have lived that reality. But the institutions, as Sanjeev said, was talking about, to me, we have to look at the corrupt nature of the global institutions. The, the world is skewed against many of us from the global south. I loved what Dr. Jaishankar said in, um, at the UN, and I'm looking at Samir over there. I don't know, you are moderating that session. And he said, someone said, what did you ask him? What is the global south? And he said, when you're from the global south, you know you're from the global south. <laughs> and I loved that. It really resonated deep within my soul because you know who you are. And... When you have institutions, let me take the example. I was at the, the Leaders Summit, the US Leaders Summit for African leaders last year, or was, was it the year before, where one president, bless his heart, will invite 50 leaders from another part of the world who will leave their countries and come and queue in his own country. I said to some of them, I met with some of them, one of them was Ruto. I said, my brother, what are you doing here? Why did you leave your house and come to another man's house to come and have a meeting? If he wants to meet you, let him come to your country. But that, I digress. One of the presidents, because they were trying to give them speaking slots, a bit like you're trying to find us all important people speaking slots here, but we've come home to your house. One of the presidents was given the microphone and spoke for 40 minutes, absolute balderdash. Absolute balderdash about how he had vaccines in cassava root in his country and how he had combated COVID and how HIV was not a thing. It was ridiculous. And the next day I went to the State Department for a meeting. I said, why did you have that man on stage? Why? And they gave me some long story. Well, fast forward six months later, when he decided that LGBTQ people were banned in his country, they suddenly decided that he had poor governance and that they weren't going to fund him anymore. And that this man who's been in power for 40 something years that you have been propping up is suddenly a bad leader. What Western institutions, and or not Western, but the global democratic institutions are basically corrupt. They're corrupt because it's not about democracy, because it's about power. It's about power when you come into my country and you can rape the ground of minerals, of diamonds, of cobalt, of nickel, that then you have good leadership. Because whoever I put there, 
whoever I am from the global north that I put there, that I can control and I can pup puppeteer, is a good leader. The minute that leader is no longer doing what I want, it is no longer a democracy. It is that which we must change. It is that which we must push back on. We cannot have a system. We cannot have a system where you sit in, be it New York or DC or London or wherever it is in the world, and you tell me what good leadership and what who, who should be a leader in my country, where you subvert democracy in my own country for your own selfish needs, because your country needs iPhones and we need certain minerals to put into those iPhones or your people will riot. And when my people then stand up and riot, you call it anti-democracy protest. That is what we must change. Yeah, I'll I, give you I examples, uh, if I may, if I may. I'll give you examples from India's neighborhood and I'll ask you to weigh in. Uh, two countries to India's uh, west and east uh, have had elections recently. Uh, for Bangladesh, uh, the US government kept saying that this was not a free and fair election and they tried to uh, make comments which the Bangladeshi leadership did not agree with. For Pakistan, repeatedly, the statement that was made was that it was a competitive election. In the past two years, the U.S. has hosted a democracy summit where Bangladesh was not invited, but Pakistan was invited. It happens to be another matter that they missed both the times. So the question then is to you, uh, Tony Abbott, who decides what is a good democracy and why should the rest of the world agree with that definition? Well, any conference that invited some guy who'd been in power for 40 years to a conference on democracies wasn't really about democracy because anyone who's been in power for 40 years uh, as, as a real ruler as opposed to a constitutional monarch is not, uh, is not a Democrat, just not a Democrat. And look, any conference that invited Pakistan but not Bangladesh is not really a conference about democracy either. I don't claim to be an expert on, on either of those countries. Um, but I do know that if you're a fair income democracy, you've got to have free and fair elections, you've got to have a robust free media, and you've got to have an independent judiciary. And India has all of those things, which is why it is an absolutely free and fair and decent and wholesome democracy. It doesn't mean it's perfect. It uh, doesn't mean that you necessarily agree with everything that the government of India does, but it is an absolute thoroughgoing democracy and these North Atlantic ratings agencies, Sanjeev, have just got it wrong. Simple as that. I agree. Hence, I'm making a fuss about it. <laughs> well, you know. Also, I mean, how do we, for me, Mike, sorry, at one point about decentralizing our political systems, because ultimately Renu was saying something about, you know, the sort of norms and the standards and the, the values. But really, surely democracy, back to the definition of democracy, is about the people. You know, so as we say in our local parlance, or in my, from my country, all na grammar, which means it's all just big words because people are not, look, they're looking for a good living. They're looking for livelihoods. They're looking to be able to eat, to feed their families, to educate their children, to have decent basic health care. The sort of Maslow's pyramid, the very bottom of those ma that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And in countries where that doesn't exist, this is where you begin to see subversion of the system. And you know, the world will say, oh, they're fighting democracy. No, they're fighting hunger. They're fighting poverty and they're fighting disease and debt. And, and so when we talk about democracy in these abstract terms, I would, I, would, I would argue and I would plead with all of you who are you know, world leaders and former leaders of government and my brother here from Tunisia, let us remember the, the man on the street. It is not about the leaders. It is about it. So democracy is not about leadership. But not, it's about the person. But democracracy in the end is going to respond to the man and woman on the street. Not in my part of the world. Much better than any other system. I mean, let's, let's take India, for instance. Uh, democratic <laughs> India has never had a famine. Um, under the Raj, there were famines. Now, um, there are all sorts of arguments about the responsibility. But the great thing about democracy is that in the end, the people make a judgment. And if the government has let them down, the government goes. That's the great thing about democracy. Yeah, but let me also clarify that democracies have no problem causing famines in other countries. <laughs> because presumably, Britain was democratic throughout that entire period. <laughs> Uh, and Ireland, Ireland, and Ireland had, a, I mean, yeah. had a famine. Yeah, had a yeah famine. maybe to, to yes, contribute I, to the I, discussion. I, I'm, uh, oh, go ahead. I know. You know, uh, of course, it's about the people, 
but the people don't always get their say. And uh, the state can be very easily captured by leaders or elites or oligarchies that claim to be democratic because they were elected. And yet, in fact, they do not care about the people at all, and they are un not accountable to the people. And so we really also have to be careful about saying, OK, it's about the people. The people are not always empowered and not always allowed to be empowered. Uh, and, and I think the, the, perhaps the test of democracy is whether the people are empowered to change their government or not. But how do you measure that? That, that is really the... How do you measure the, that? You measure the, it by the vote. But, but if the vote alone no, does not yes, count... But, but, but elections are not, are not the real criterion for that? democracy. The ability to dissent and to change your yeah, government yeah, periodically yeah. is truly the test of democracy. Which is one of the reasons why and, India and, is and a robust democracy. In other words, holding your leaders, your rulers. I, I, I don't like the word leaders because many of those people are rulers rather than leaders. Maybe so being right. able to hold your rulers accountable and seeing a corrupt ruler in jail, in jail or out of office, then you really have democracy because that's the vox populi. Right. The, the other thing I want to comment on very quickly because a lot has been going on is this issue of contextualization, which I, with all due respect, and you know, we want to, it's our culture, etc. Contextualization can be used as an excuse to repress people. And I will give you an example from my region, the Arab world, which uh, you said is so successful at democracy. Mm -hmm. uh, I presume you were being sarcastic. Uh, <laughs> for example, the rights of women are severely limited in the Arab region. Would you agree with me or not? Uh, uh, let's now, uh, perhaps Tunisia is more, uh, uh, gives more rights to women, and I have met extremely uh, strong and powerful uh, Tunisian women that I respect. But on the whole, women have no political voice. Their participation in the economy is very limited. And the rights they have, the civil rights, that they have are limited, and the legal rights. And often, this is attributed to culture, tradition, and religion. And therefore, democracy in those countries has to be contextualized in order to, to keep women suppressed, because this is part of our tradition, and our culture, and our, uh, and our religion. But really, all of those are an excuse. They're an excuse because in a, a, a paternalistic country where men hold all the power, they do not want to relinquish any. Yes. Why should they? And therefore, they find every excuse in order to contextualize. And, and I, I bring in the issue of women because it's the most obvious one. But there are lots of ways uh, for example, in Iraq, my own country, a lot of democratic sort of uh, diminishment happens um, with the excuse of tribalism, tribal laws, tribal traditions, and so on. In the end, these suppress people, these harm people, and democracy is abridged because of this pretext that we have a culture and we have a heritage and we have tradition that do not allow us to do this, that, and the other. So contextualization can be very, very, a very bad very weapon. Important. I, I will come to you, Mehdi Joma, but I want to take, uh, uh, take this conversation forward. You mentioned women, women's rights. Um, in the US, uh, women are losing the right to abortion and the right to their own bodies and choices. And the US also has Donald Trump most likely on the ballot. And if he gets elected, would you call America then a backsliding democracy? By the way, I think many mature democracies are backsliding, or I should put it this way. 
I think there are two types of assaults on democracy. One in established democracies, such as America, such as Germany, such as all sorts of other countries uh, in the West, in the North Atlantic West. Uh, I mean, Denmark is famously difficult to get to and maintain. But there is a backsliding, not just in the US. And the other challenge, of course, is in the nascent democracies that are challenged because of the profusion of media and the internet and so on. So there are many challenges of, uh, to democracy, including in what we think of as developed democracies. Yes. Mary Juma, thank yeah, you for your uh, About abortion, just for the history, some uh, European countries were, were used to, to come to Tunisia to make abortion in the 70s and 80s because it was allowed by law in Tunisia but not in Europe. So just one remark. Sometimes you find something in the south that you cannot find in the, in the north. Uh, now, about the discussion about the democracy, I'm a member of Club de Madrid, who is gathering uh, 100 of leaders, uh, uh, head of governments and presidents from uh, uh, the democratic countries. And uh, you can imagine that uh, one of the major theme and action is around democracy, and we have many, many debates about uh, diversity and uh, so on. Uh, really, what is important, uh, whatever uh, the, the context is different than the diversity, uh, is to respect some fun fundamentals for the democracy. Uh, uh, the, the rule of law, the constitution, uh, the respect of robust institution, uh, institution over the leaders, over I mean the persons, uh, the freedom uh, choosing uh, the, the, through uh, a free, uh, free election. Uh, and, and after we have to take into account some some diversity but fundamentally we have to respect these fundamentals which are really important without the rule of law without the respect of uh, of the freedom of the people uh, without uh, the institution without the constitution which is clear defined fixed and respected you cannot speak about uh, democracy <laughs> Sanjeev. so i think i have some problem about this idea that just having free and fair elections and uh, is not good enough and that um, you have to have some external validation through values. Um, for example, let's take Japan. For almost its entire history since, 90, since the Second World War, it has been ruled by the same party, LDP. Um, presumably the Japanese are democratic, they have the choice to change their government, they don't bother to. Maybe they do a good job, I don't know. Um, the Singaporeans, I am witness to the fact that the elections are actually free, but then they have been ruled by the same party all through. Now one can argue, look, they were delivering, Lee Kuan Yew did a fabulous job, so have his successors, why would they want to change? But many other, uh, those who sort of prefer the values approach would say that neither Japan or Singapore are um, democratic. Uh, even India, you can say that it's not democratic because uh, one party, in fact, one family for much of this period of democracy was ruling this country. So I think this is a very tricky and slippery slope uh, because it requires these subjective expert opinions and I don't trust those experts. I'd much rather simply go with much more clear objective measures. Can, does the election happen? Is it, is it free and fair? Whether or not people are being bribed with, uh, you know, cassava, onions, or bottles of rum, well, that is a reflection of that society. If that the people of that society are so easily bribed, that is not a measure of democracy. That is a measure of other failures in society. Why load democracy with this problem? Um, it's a democratic but flawed society. So I think the real issue here is. I think we expect that democracy somehow leads to clear, obvious, good outcomes. I think democracy is just, as I said right at the beginning, is one of two legs. Uh, in fact, it's a multi-legged beast in some, at, at another level. And it's just one of the legs that society has to elect and have a peaceful way of removing bad leaders. Doesn't always lead to great outcomes. I mean, our own history is such that we were on the economic front utter failures till well into the 90s. 
Um, we were democratic before that, uh, but we weren't succeeding on this front. Were we not democratic before that? Um, were we not democratic because we only had prime ministers from one family? I think we were democratic. It's just that we as a society wanted that, you know, dynastic stagnation. And so that's what we elected, that that's what we got. So it says time's up, but it's not really, because Tony and I have the, have the mic. <laughs> so you all are stuck here with us for the next half an hour. Um, but, you know, back to Sanjeev's point about free and fair elections and, and what have you, and who, back to the sort of who measures what is democracy or what is right. We have also this global phenomenon where they send out election um, observers to countries that they call nascent democracies and they ask and they come and see whether our elections have been free and fair. And I would posit that who gives that power? Because it is that which says, typically, the Commonwealth, the UN, everybody who comes in, they are the ones who walk away and they decide whether election has been free and fair. They're the ones, I don't know whether you have that experience here, but they're the ones who speak to the candidates during that election and they sit them in darkened rooms and they say, no, you must not make a fuss because if you make a fuss, World Bank will not fund your country. World Bank will not support your country. And therefore they come and they subvert, to my mind, in many ways, elections. That is what we also must look at changing. The other point there is that I really think it is now at a time, if this is what we're going to do, where perhaps we also from the global south should begin. I quite frankly, I think it's valid now. We should send election observers to the US election which is send election observers to the UK and to the EU, and we should go and see whether their elections are free and fair, because what's good for the goose is good for the gander. We must begin to have equal standards. We talk about equity around the world. Let it apply always. You know, free and fair, who says what's free and fair? It's not just whether they say it's free and fair, it's the conditionalities that are attached to it. But now I see that Samir says it's time Do you for think a drink, that the so. Ar do the Arabs get to, to do a spring in the Capitol Hill? <laughs> no. No. We are out of time. We'll have the uh, closing comments. Just, yeah. just one remark about the observers. Yeah. Just you have, I organized the elections and uh, there was in a small country like Tunisia, 1,000 uh, foreign observers, but we wanted them. But we put them with 20,000 local observers and it was, was organized and uh, it was good to get them because uh, it's uh, an external point of view. They are not a judge. But uh, it's good to have an opinion from people who are trained to uh, fair elections, but not to give them the judgment or uh, to say, uh, I can stamp or not. It's not the idea. Really observers. Uh, uh, it depends on the country and the organization to, uh, to accept them. Right. 30 seconds, Tony Abbott. Well, what, what we all want is good government based on fundamental human values and democracy is normally the best way of bringing that about. Uh, as Winston Churchill said, it's the worst possible system except for all the others. And I just want to finish on this note. Uh, just because Donald Trump might become a candidate and just because he might become president again doesn't mean that America is backsliding as a democracy. It might just mean that the American people make a choice others don't agree with. Simple as that. You've said it at the end of the session. There's so much to say about it, but yes, thank you.